Good morning, everyone. My name is Mariano Mendez. <laughs> I'm the main organizer of the IU IHAO uh, activities. Unfortunately, for personal reasons, I could not travel to South Africa. I left the organizations in the hands of Mateo and Carlos. Unfortunately for you, I hope they managed to keep it okay. I trust Mateo, but not Carlos, as he knows. And so that's your destiny, I'm sorry. Okay, I need to go ahead and uh, start my lecture. I was asked to teach a lecture on statistics and I made this video to avoid any connection problems. This is not going to be a full course on statistics because it, you cannot fit all that in one hour, but it's a sort of a refresher with some definitions. Hmm. And statistics is very important when you want to fit data because you want to assess the confidence you have in a certain model or in a certain parameter of a model, and that comes from this. So let me start with some basic stuff, some definitions. So let's suppose we have a set of events that we will call X, Y, or Z. For instance, this could be the result of throwing a dice, and it could be one to six, or taking a card from a deck, or more suitable to your needs. This could be uh, the number of photons that you count in a given detector in a given energy channel. It can also be not just what you detect in one channel, but the number of photons that you detect in all the energy channels of your spectrum for a source. Um, and I have more than one, okay, just to have uh, for certain definitions. You can call the complement of the same set of events, the negation is not X, not Y, not Z, for instance, if a die is um, a one, then X is one, not X is two, three, four, five, six, etc. Then uh, we define something called the probability of X. What is the probability of having a certain number X? What is the probability of getting a one when you saw it, throw a die? Or what is the probability of having so many photons in a given um, energy channel, or what is the probability of having the photons in each channel of the whole spectrum that you obtain? It's called the probability distribution function or PDF of X. We have probabilities that are conditional. So something is conditional on something else. What is the probability of X given Y? What is the probability that I take an ace from a, from a, a deck of cards, if I already got an ace before, is different than if I didn't get an ace before. So this is called the conditional probability. And then we have uh, the or relation, what is the probability of getting x or y, what is the probability of getting a one or a two if I throw a die, and what is the probability of getting X and Y to getting one and a two, for instance, if I throw two dice. And then uh, uh, we say that something is false if it has a probability of zero and something is true if it has a probability of one or 100%. These are just definitions. There are certain rules. The probability that something is not X is one minus the probability of X. I'm not going to go into the details. This can be proven most likely mathematically, but I will just take it as intuitive. What is the probability of having both X and Y that you write this way with a comma here? It is the probability of getting X given Y times the probability of Y. If X and Y are independent, then the probability of getting X given Y is independent of Y, so it's simply the probability of X. So this formula becomes the product of the probabilities, which I'm pretty sure you're aware of. This one 
can also be proven. The probability of X getting X or Y, not and Y, is the probability of getting X plus the probability of getting Y minus the probability of getting both. If these two are mutually exclusive, then the probability of having both is zero. So what is the probability that it rains or it doesn't rain is the probability that it rains plus the probability it doesn't rain minus the probability that it rains and it doesn't rain, which is zero because they are mutually exclusive in this case. There is a theorem called the bias theorem. My screen is, my image is um, covering something but I hope not so nothing important. And it says something as follows. You know that the probability of having X and Y is the same as prob the probability of getting Y and X. It doesn't matter in which order you take them. The probability of throwing two dice and getting a one and a two is the same as the probability of getting a two and a Y, a one. But from the definition, we know that this probability, we, we saw it before here, what is the probability of X and Y? is the probability of X given Y times the probability of Y. While the probability of Y and X is the same, but with the Y and X is reversed. So it's the probability of Y given X times the probability of X. And this sounds very silly. It's not a very interesting formula, you would think, but it has been the source of a very heated debates in science in the last century. It's a theorem. It was uh, proposed by a monk base and the idea he had behind this was trying to prove that God existed and he used tried to use statistics probabilities to do that. Suppose now that we call x equal to model here and y equal to data and so now you are saying here what is the probability of the model given the data here you're saying what is the probability of the data given the model. So doing that here, I say the probability of the data given the model is something that we call likelihood. What is the likelihood of having the current data that I have if the model that I assume is correct? Another thing is the probability that the model is correct given the data. It's a different uh, concept. This thing is called the posterior in this thing. There are these other things, the probability of the data and the probability of the model. The probability of the model before the experiment is called the prior and the probability of the data is a factor that is a normalization because all probabilities have to add up to one such that this integral adds up to one is called the evidence. I'm not going to go into much detail in this I'm just going to introduce the idea, and you can, I will at the end give a book that you can use to read more if you want. The probability for those Bayesian statisticians uh, represents a degree of belief or plausibility. How much do you think that the model is true based on the evidence in the data at hand? But then in the 19th century, uh, mathematicians thought, oh, this is a bit too vague a statement because too um, personal statement, because I'm talking about degree of belief. And so they tried to um, change the way you define statistics by using what is well is now known as the frequentist approach, which is to assume that there is an infinitely large number of experiments and then we look at the number of occurrences of certain events divided by the total number of events to calculate the probabilities. For instance, if I throw a dice a um, thousand times, million times, infinite number of times, I would get, if the die is fair, I would get equal numbers of ones, equal numbers of twos, equal numbers of threes, etc. Of course, this is a thought experiment, if you want, because you cannot throw a die infinite number of times. And if you don't do that, if you don't throw it an infinite number of times, if you throw it six times, you will not get one, then another times two, another times three, another times four. You can get twice two and no one, for instance. 
So you have to go really to a very large number, infinite number, to measure this frequentist approach. And this has been a lot of uh, cost a lot of discussions and um, many well-known statisticians in the 20th century who rejected Bayesian statistics and stat uh, Bayesian statisticians who criticized enormously the frequentist approach. In fact, Bayesian analysis is much more interesting because it also t sets the way we think and we reason. Like, as I wrote in this four-step reasoning mechanism, you start with a certain belief about something, you have some prior about what you think should happen, then you do an experiment and you test your belief, then you measure the probability of getting such a data given your belief, and that is the likelihood. But you can adjust your belief by uh, con connecting the prior and the likelihood to get the posterior, which will be the new, your new belief, now, given the data, and by a theorem tells you how to do that. And then our new belief becomes the new prior, and we can do a new experiment with a different prior. One thing that is important to realize is that in all, all these equations, I talk about the probability of something given something else. And then here I put the probability of something without something else given something else. But one thing one has to realize is that all probabilities are conditional, even if we don't write them up. What is the probability that it rains today where you are? Well, it depends that you are there. If you are in Poch, sorry that I don't know how to pronounce the whole full name of the place. So it's different. The probability that it rains today is not the same there as it is here in the Netherlands. Here it's very likely that it rains. But it's also, it depends on the, the, the fact that you are in the spring, almost, or that whether it is cloudy or whatever. What is the probability to get a, a six in a die? Well, depending whether the die is fair. If the die is fair, it's one six. But if the die is going to give always six, then it's not one six. So the probability of getting a six in a die is not just a concept on its own. It depends on some other things. Also, that the drawer, the thrower is fair, that the stable surface is something more into our business. What is the probability to have n photons with energy between these two values? I don't know. It depends whether the source is a black body or is a power law or is some other physical mechanism, whether I'm using XMM Newton or am I using NICER or whatever. So all the probabilities in the end, they are all conditional. At some point, we don't look at that conditionality, but they are conditional to them. There are two um, very important probability distribution functions. There are many, but there are two that are very important and applicable to our science. And the first one I will discuss is called the Poisson distribution. Is the probability of measuring a certain event x and in this case, X is a discrete variable. For instance, how many photons you detect in a given channel within a certain, for a certain detector within a certain interval of time. And it's written by this formula where the, here is the factorial. Remember this number is now a discrete number. So it's an integer number. I write it X for gener uh, general terms, but it's a discrete number. And the quantity mu is called the mean of the distribution defined as, oops, sorry for that, defined as the sum from all possible values of this um, event that goes from zero to infinity, but it's again discrete, it's an integer number of X multiplied by this probability. And if you do that, you end up with mu. So mu is the mean of the distribution, as you know. And the variance, which is X minus mu square multiplied by the probability and added up over all possible events for the Poisson distribution is also mu. So for the if you count a certain number of photons in a detector in a certain time, you know that the expected value, which is the mean, is going to be something, and the standard deviation around that mean is going to be the same as the uh, value. Well, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, so it's going to be the square root of this. That's why the error in Poissonian statistics goes like the square root of the counts. 
the variance is the standard deviation square. The Poisson distribution looks like this, depending on what is the, the, the average. And again, because it's a discrete function, it's only sampled at discrete values of x. So it's very asymmetric when mu is small and start to become more and more symmetrics with when mu becomes uh, larger and larger. And the standard deviation, so sort of the width of this distribution depends is equal to mu, uh, the square root of mu in reality. The other important distribution, probability distribution function is the Gaussian distribution function. Now x is a continuous variable in this case, and is written by this formula that has two parameters, sigma and mu, sigma again here, and gives you the probability that x is between x and x plus dx. And if you calculate the mean the same way as before, but now it's integrals because it's a, a continuous function. So before it was a sum, the mean and the variance, but here now is an integral is the same. It turns out the mean is mu. So this parameter here is the mean of the distribution. And this parameter sigma square is, sorry, is the variance of the distribution. And now <clears throat> that we saw those two distributions, let's consider a little bit more philosophically what we have. Let me move this up. We always measure random variables. So everything that we measure in nature is a random quantity. When we measure the number of photons in a detector, we cannot be deterministic. If we repeat the experiment like the frequentists, like like to think uh, many times that and expose the same source for the same amount of time with the same detector and uh, count how many photons we get in a channel, this thing will not be the same every time. This number, if one time is 10, maybe the next time we do the experiment is nine and the next time is seven and the next time is 12. There is an intrinsic variability in the process. In fact, that in particular, this example of the source measurements, that if, if I repeat the experiments many times, I will see not always the same number of photons. I will the photons for certain mathematical considerations will follow a Poissonian distribution. So if I go back, go back to my slide, I need to click, go back to this slide. So if, if my source emits on average 10 photons in a certain time interval, uh, in a certain energy channel, and I measure on average 10 photons, I have a very large probability of measuring 10, but I have a, a quite good probability of measuring 11 or measuring nine or measuring eight or measuring 12. I have a rather small chance of measuring 20 or zero, but it can happen, right? Uh, the probability tells you that if I do enough experiments, these, measurements will also come. They are not going to be always 10. This is the meaning of this probability. So all quantities that we measure are random variables. But if that's the, the situation, and if I measure a source and I get 10 photons, and the next time I get nine, and the next time I get 11, what is the true photon number that I should report in my paper? Let's look at this from a probabilistic point of view. Suppose that we have a set of n measurement of the number of photons counted within a certain time interval delta t that we call ni is a set of measurements. That's why this curly bracket and these photons, for instance, were measured in different channels i, channel one, channel two, etc. If the distribution of these photons is Poissonian, then the probability of measuring Ni photons in a certain given um, interval is, is done by, is given by this probability, is the probability of measuring that number given that the mean is mu 
is given by the usual formula. Now, instead of X, I put an I here. But notice that I don't know mu because actually that's what I want to know. I only know what I measure, but I'm looking for the true mean value of the source. This is the probability of measuring photons in one of these intervals I. Now I have N of those intervals. If I want to know what is the probability that I observe each of them, all of them, and I assume that the individual measurements are independent, so the fact that I measure certain N1 and N2, the N2 is not affected by what I measure in N1, the N3 is not affected by what I measure in N1 and N2, etc. If they are all independent, then to get the probability of getting all this event, this is only one of these NI, but I want to get all of them. If they are independent, remember the rule of the uh, probability of AND is the probability of X times the probability of Y. Here I have the probability of each of these NI, so I have to multiply them all. So that's what I wrote here. The source emits this number of photons, mu. So what is the probability that I get all these measurements for all the Ni, given that the average is mu? It is the product of the individual probabilities because they are independent. So there is only P of X times P of Y multiplied over all the events. And now I write explicitly this, which is what I had in the previous page. And this thing is called the likelihood. This is the likelihood that I measure what I measured, given that the source emits at an average rate mu. So it's the probability of the data given the model, remember Bayesian. This is called the likelihood. What is the likelihood of getting the observed data set given the model? There is a principle when one says fit data. I remember once in one of these workshops, a student asked, what does it mean to fit data? To fit data means to write the likelihood of the data given the model and max and see for which parameter, in this case, for which mu, this likelihood is maximum. The most likely outcome of my experiment will tell me something about what is the mu. So there is a principle, there is no mathematical demonstration, it's just a principle. And it says that the most likely outcome of an experiment is the one that maximizes RL. So I want to maximize this function in terms of mu. For which value of mu will this be maximum? It is equivalent and it's easier to maximize the logarithm of this thing because a logarithmic logarithm is a, a monotonic function. So it continues. It's, if, if the function increases, the logarithm also increases. And if it decreases, also decreases. So it is simpler to maximize log L. So remember, I have to maximize this with respect to mu. But now I will do the logarithm and I will do the logarithm of a product. So the logarithm of a product, if you go back, is going to be the sum of the logarithms of the terms by the property of the logarithms. So it's the logarithm of the terms. And now if you do the logarithm of these, is this is a product and a, a ratio. And so it's the logarithm of that plus the logarithm of this minus the logarithm of that. But then, okay, you keep applying properties of the logarithm. So you end up with this relation. It's very simple mathematics. So you want to maximize this function for mu. So for which value of mu is this maximum? So the way to do it is to calculate the derivative of this function with respect to mu and equate that to zero, which is what you do. It's a very simple derivative because you have to calculate the derivative with respect to mu. And this is a constant for that. So this term, the derivative of that is zero. So you end up with this term, which if you work out a little bit gives that mu is one over m the sum of all the Ni's, so the average. So what this tells you is that the average of your measurement is the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean, okay? 
So now I have these measurements. I know all this Ni. That was how I started. I calculate the average of those Ni, and they give me something that I did not know beforehand. This was my model, if you want. It's the most likely, um, it's, it's the value that will be most, uh, will make my measurement the most likely ones. Well, you know this result, it's a well-known result. So now we saw in a very simple example, what does it mean to, to fit, maximize a likelihood? But the, the quantities that we measure are random variables. I told you this Ni that I measure are random variables. If I, if I do the experiment again the next day, I will not get exactly the same Ni's. So when I do this average, this mu will not be exactly the same. So if I repeat the experiment many times, I will get each time a different set of Ni, which when I average will give me a different mu. So now mu will also be a random variable. The Ni's were random variables. So now my model parameter is mu in this case, is going to be a random variable. <clears throat> so as I wrote here, <clears throat> because we always measure random variables, it doesn't matter how accurate we are, we will always have an associated error. Our parameters of the model will also be a random variable. So if you fit something to data and you have some model, it doesn't matter, this, this is just a random plot, this would be your measurements, but then you fit a model, this model will have errors. The parameters of this model will have errors. We, we will not know them exactly. So let's uh, look at another example and see how we can get parameters. We are getting closer to what you really do with data. Suppose now that I have this a data set, I measure these quantities y sub i, going from one to n, and they represent the, the spectrum of a source. That is the number of photons as a function of energy with some instrument, with some uh, detector, oops. My question, my first question is, what is the probability that I get this spectrum, this data, given that I assumed a certain model for my source? Again, this is the likelihood data given the model. What is the probability that I get this data given the model? As in the case of the Poisson example that I did before, we need to know what is the probability distribution function of the observations of the data. Let's now assume that each energy, at each energy, these quantities follow a Gaussian distribution. So they, they are not Poissonian in this case, but they are Gaussian. And they are around the model with a certain error. So what it means is that at each energy, the data are random realizations of the model that I write this way. This is a model now, it's not the data, there is no sub-index i, is the model for a certain parameter a. a is actually a vector of so many elements. It could be a complex model with one parameter or with 100 parameters. So now I assume that each of these measurements is distributed around the expected value of that model. Again, I yet don't know these numbers, but I will assume that I know them to write the equation, but I don't know them, I need to find them. So I will assume that these numbers will be scattered around the predicted value at that particular energy for a given parameter. So what I'm saying is that the probability of measuring this data given the model, remember, I have to do the product of the of each of my old measurements. I went one step uh, uh, quicker this time. So what I'm saying is that if I know the probability of one and I want to know the probability of all, I have to make the multiplications of all the probabilities. And then the probability of one is what I wrote here is the data are distributed around the model with a certain error sigma. So this the, the, the expected value of the data is the model. Yeah? 
at a given energy i for a given parameter a or set of parameters a which i don't know and then i do the product for all the elements in my spectrum and now i if i do that the product of these two things is the product of these terms and then the exponent the product of the exponential is the exponential of the sum the only thing you do here is you separate this term is the product of all these is now the product of only this big parenthesis. And then you also do the product of all these, but the product of the exponential becomes the sum, the exponential of the sums. And if I want to maximize this, it's the same as minimizing this because of the minus sign here, making this smaller will make the whole thing bigger with respect to A, which I don't know. So I have to minimize a quantity that I now have on the exponent and I can take out the minus uh, the, the minus one half out. So actually I need to maximize one half, minimize, sorry, one half of that, but I, it's the same as minimizing only that. So I have to minimize this quantity that I can call chi square because it's a square quantity and it's the sum of the, do I have? Here. Sorry. It's the sum of the data minus the model square divided divided by the error square. So to maximize this likelihood is the same as minimizing this quantity or minimizing chi square, which is what we normally do in the fitting. But notice, notice that to do that, we make an assumption. We made the assumption that all these measurements follow a Gaussian distribution around the model with errors sigma i. So we assumed here explicitly, we assumed that the data follow a Gaussian distribution. And the reason why we get this is because of the Gaussian form here, because of this Gaussian form. If this was a different form, we would not have gotten this. So if the errors are Gaussian, and only then maximum likelihood is equivalent to minimum chi-square. So when you minimize chi-square, you're applying the, the maximum uh, likelihood principle if the data are Gaussian. If the data are not Gaussian, you can still apply chi-square, nothing wrong, but then you're not, ensure, you're not sure that you're getting the maximum likelihood of your data. Chi-square will give you some best fit in some sense, but it's not the maximum likelihood fit, okay? We know that the data that we measure in X-rays are Poissonian, we count photons. And whenever you count something, you have a Poissonian distribution. So in principle, this procedure is not applicable because we are not in this situation where the data are Gaussian. We are in a situation where they are Poissonian. However, if mu is large, the Poisson distribution tends to the Gaussian distributions. So if you, if you, I have to go a few slides back here. As you see, you know how the Gaussian distribution is. I should have shown a, a plot of the Gaussian distribution, but I didn't, but it looks more or less like this. It's a, it's a bell shape. And as you see, as the mu increases, the shape of the Poisson distribution becomes more and more bell shaped and more and more symmetric. And if mu continues increasing, so if the uh, uh, mean is large, Poissonian tends to Gaussian. So again, back to where I was. So if mu is large, this is true. If your source is very bright, so you have many counts per bean, so the mean count rate mu in each bean is large, then your distribution will be close to Gaussian. It will not be Gaussian, but it will be close to Gaussian. So you could more or less trust that using chi-square makes sense. One way to deal with astronomical data is to rebin. Uh, the data. Suppose you, your source is not that bright and you have, I don't know, one or two photons per channel and you want to go to the um, Gaussian statistical situation, you need to have at least 10, probably more, even 25 or whatever photons per channel, but you cannot. 
The only way to do that is to take several channels together, combine them and make one channel out of 10, for instance, in order to have a large number of photons in each channel, but then you pay a price because you lose your resolution. Alternatively, you, you can try to write a maximum likelihood algorithm. The, the problem with the, with the maximum likelihood, some people use them. There are some ways to do that in expect, for instance. The problem is that many of the properties of the chi-square are very handy to give quick um, interpretation of the data, while the maximum likelihood, they are not so direct. Certain things are not so direct. But now, Let's assume your data are Gaussian, and let's see what is the usual procedure to take the advantages of chi-square, of using the chi-square. One of the things that you get is the goodness of the fit. So how do, how do I know that my fit is good? Even if my chi-square is minimum, maybe the fit is not good. It's the minimum I can attain, but it's not a good fit. The reason why chi-square is, is a good thing to use, if possible, is that it gives you that, how good is the fit. And the reason for that is because the quantity chi-square that we use follow a certain distribution that I did not explain. It's called the chi-square distribution with n degrees of freedom, where n is n big minus m, n is the number of channels, and m is the number of parameters. So if I know how many channels I have and how many parameters I use in my model, I can calculate this. I get this from the fit, and there is there are tables or there are programs that calculate this probability distribution function. It looks like this. So if the, uh, the number of degrees of freedom is, for instance, 10, this is how the probability looks like. And so the peak of the distribution in that case is about 8. If the number of uh, degrees of freedom is 5, the peak is as 3. So if I get a chi-square of, of 8 for 10 degrees of freedom, I'm at the maximum of that probability, which is what I want. So um, the expected value of the chi-square distribution is n minus m, and the variance is 2 times n minus m. So how broad this is depends on this number, twice this number. So the bigger the number, the broader the distribution. But okay, you don't need to know all that. Expect gives you automatically something about that. And there is a general rule of thumb that we use, sorry, before I go there, to know. So what we want is that your chi-square in the fit is more or less the same as your number of degrees of freedom. When you get chi-square more or less the same as the, as the number of degrees of freedom, then your fit is good, statistically speaking. I'll get back to that in a moment. But remember that so far what we are doing is we're fitting, if you go back to my notes before, and if you go to this slide, this slide, what we're calculating is the likelihood. The chi-square is another name for likelihood, is the log of the likelihood, if you want. So we are measuring the likelihood. What is the probability of the data given the model, but what we want to know is not that. We want to know what is the probability of the model, given the data. What is the probability of the parameters, given the data? And now comes Bayes' theorem here. We have the probability of the data given the model, but we want the probability, uh, sorry, the other way around. We have the probability of the data given the model here, but we want the probability of the model given the data. That's what we want, because that's what science asks from us. So we need to maximize the posterior, not the likelihood. And you remember that the posterior is proportional to the likelihood multiplied by the prior. And this constant of proportionality is, there is a term dividing, that is the probability of the data or the evidence, as I called it, if you go back to the slides, is not that crucial because that is a normalization constant such that the integral of this probability is one. That's the whole story. So there is a, something here that serves as a normalization factor to get the, um, the probabilities adding up to one. That's all it is. 
So in essence, what you're interested in is in this product of the likelihood that I explained you get from the chi square multiplied by your prior. But if we don't have any prior information about the model, if we don't know much about the model, about the parameters in the model, we can choose a uniform prior to this. So any parameter is possible within a certain range. So, so that the, the, the likelihood is, so this is would be a constant now over a certain range of the parameters such that con it contains the likelihood. So graphically it's like this. If this is my likelihood and I'm not interested in the probability of the data given the model, but I'm interested in the probability of the model given the data, but I don't have any prior, then I take some constant prior for that particular parameter such that it is constant but it contains the bulk of my likelihood. In essence, in practical terms, it means nothing. You just basically convert the likelihood into the posterior by saying, I know nothing about that parameter. If you do know something about the parameter, it doesn't happen very often, but you can also do that. You can put your likelihood, your posterior, really as it is. It could be some function that is like this. I don't know. If you know the shape of your prior, because for instance, people measured the parameter before for the same source in the same state, I don't know, and they give their likelihood or posterior, you can use that as your prior. And that will change. the Now, the most likely value of the parameter is lambda zero. If your prior is constant, that doesn't change. Constant and includes the bulk of the likelihood, that doesn't change. But if your prior was some function like this, you would have to multiply one by the other and that will have a maximum somewhere else in a different place. So that is possible. Once you have the, the, um, the posterior, it could be the, directly the likelihood, as I said, because if you assume that the prior is constant, the posterior and the likelihood are the same, basically. Once you have the posterior, you don't only want to give to give the most likely value, you also want to say how confident you are that this value is correct. So, okay, in which range it can go? So for instance, this is the most likely, if this was my probability of the model given the data, if this is my posterior for a certain parameter X, so what is the probability of that parameter given the data? This is the most likely value. But that's not enough. You cannot say how that this is the most likely because you also have to say in which range you have a certain confidence that the parameter is located. So for instance, if this shaded area contains 90% of this total area, you can say that with 90% confidence, the parameter is in this shaded area from X1 to X2. Sorry, what did I do? Or you can say 68%, I don't know. These are classical numbers. 68% is one sigma, 90% is another number. So you can say with which confidence your parameter is between, you can say, okay, my parameter is X zero and with 90% confidence or 68% confidence is between X one and X two. You can also give it as an error. This minus that is the positive error. This minus that is the negative error. Right. There are ways to do it. Um, if the if the posterior is symmetric, the plus and minus errors are the same. If the posterior is asymmetric, you can give the, the positive and negative errors separately. One note about asymmetric errors. It's not nice to write in a paper plus uh, 0 0.1 minus 0 0.1. You should write plus plus minus 0 0.1, not plus one number minus the same number. You also be careful if, if uh, the errors have errors as, as well. So if you have point plus point 0.1 minus point 0.11, uh, then make it plus minus point 0.1 or plus minus point 0.11, but don't write plus point 0.1 minus point 0.11. Sometimes the probability distribution of the posteriors are not symmetric or are not single uh, valued. The, they don't have a single maximum. They are multimodal. They have multi-maxima. If I give this case, if I show you 
it's an invented case. Suppose I get a posterior like this. What is the best value of my, par my parameter x? Is it minus 10 or is it 10? Or should I give the average? Should I say, okay, the average is zero here. So should I say the most likely value is zero plus minus 10? Mm, but notice that zero has zero probability. So the probability that the parameter is zero is very small. It's very high if it is minus 10, it is very high if it is 10, but it's very small if it is zero. So given the average is not probably the good thing. Probably it's much better to say, well, my distribution is multimodal. I have a maximum at minus 10 with an error of plus minus one and another maximum at 10 with an error of plus minus one, perhaps, I don't know. If you're fitting chi-square because your data allows you to do that, allow you because data is plural, if you decide to minimize the chi-square, consider the following. A typical error of all the students I had is I want to get a chi-square of zero. Oh, because that means that the, 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 the model goes exactly through the data. But the data has errors. And we will see a little bit of a sort of graphical example of what I mean. So you want to find the most likely value of your chi-square is the one that is more or less equal to the number of degrees of freedom, as we showed before. There is a quantity called the reduced chi-square, which is the chi-square divided by the number of degrees of freedom. And that number should be more or less one. When chi-square is equal to the number of degrees of freedom, the ratio is approximately one. And that is the most likely value of your chi-square if your fit is good. So against your inst intuition, having a chi-square close to zero is worse than having a, a reduced chi-square close to one. So once you reach chi-square more or less one, you don't need to keep adding parameters to make it even smaller because now you're uh, uh, not improving your model, you're making it worse. Let me show you this graphical. Imagine that I gave you this data and then I fitted the model and this is the data minus the model divided by the error. In XPEC is a quantity called del. So if you plot your spectrum, you usually plot data or L logarithm of the data and then you plot the residuals before below. You can plot data minus model or the ratio of the data divided model, or you can plot data minus model divided by sigma. I like this quantity because it has a, 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 a nice property is the error bars, when you do it this way, all the error bars are equal to one. They are all the same. So in a plot graphically, they immediately tell you where you have problems in your feed. Whenever the deviations are large, more than three or so, they are more than three sigma away from the model. So it's very clear to show. So suppose I have this data that I fitted with the model. And now when I plot this quantity, I get this. This is zero because it's the average of these points. And they are all distributed this way with errors equal to one. What this shows you is that the dispersion of these uh, points is very large. And that is what you see in the red line is a simulation. I simulated points that have this dispersion around zero and they have a very large dispersion. Whereas the errors, if I take a Gaussian with this sigma is this black line. So this black line is a Gaussian with a sigma equal to this length. Well, this red line here is, sorry, this red line is the spread, the Gaussian that represents the spread of the data around zero. And what you see here is that your spread is much larger than the errors. So in this case, your chi-square will be large. And the fit is likely not good. The opposite situation is when you have this. All your points are very close to zero so the data minus model divided by sigma is very close to zero, but intrinsically they have large errors. If I do the same exercise, again, now black is the Gaussian that is represented by this error, and the red is the dispersion of the dots around zero. And what you see now is that the points are very close to zero, but the Gaussian that is represented by the errors is much broader. So something is wrong here. Your errors are these error bars that I'm drawing here 
are too large to the dispersion of the data. And the errors should reflect the fact that your data will be dispersed around the zero. In this case, the two are the same. So now your points are spread around zero by the same average dispersion as the one depicted by the errors. So that's why the two Gaussians are the same. In this case, the chi-square will be one, reduced chi-square. In this case, the reduced chi-square will be close to zero. And in this case, the reduced chi-square will be much larger than one. So here you, you can say, okay, my fit is not very good. My points deviate a lot. But here the fit is also not good because the points should deviate more, but they don't. And so this is the line. Reduced chi-square should be around one. Don't try to go further and make it smaller because you're going to the wrong, in the wrong direction. I think this is my last topic of this class. I'm not sure, I think. <laughs> Is one more thing that one has to keep in mind is the following. I told you, minimizing chi-square, you minimize this thing. You have a quantity here that is called sigma. It's actually the square root of the model. In the way it is defined, I did not go in the details, but the way it is defined is the square root of the model. So it's the expected error once I know the model. The problem is I don't know the model. That's why I'm trying to fit. This is the model and I'm trying to fit it. So how can I calculate the chi-square if I don't know this term until I fit? I need to fit to get this term, but I need this term to get the fit. So it's an endless story. Oops. So we only know this after we fitted the model. What we normally does is we change this quantity. Instead of using the square root of the model, we take the square root of the data, which is a proxy to the expected model. But this thing is not really totally correct. It's a biased quantity. Let me show you why. For instance, suppose that a certain channel has a certain number of photons, and we take the error as the square root of that number. Suppose your source emits an average 10 counts per second. So I'm looking in certain intervals of a second, and each time I measure how many photons my source is emitting, and I see, okay, on average it's 10. Suppose, I don't know, of course, because I don't know the model, but suppose I knew the model for this thought experiment. I knew that the source was emitting 10 photons. And if I do measurements, sometimes I will measure 9, 8, 11, 12, etc. right? Now, if I take the square root of the measurement as the error, this measurement, by chance, ended up much lower than that measurement. So this one will have a smaller error, because it's the square root of the number, than that one. Now, if I fit the chi-square using this error as the sigma that I need in, in this equation, so this sigma here, I take the square root of the measurement, not the square root of the, of the expected model. This point will wait a lot in the fit. It will bring the line down because that's what it means. A small error means, oh, this quantity is better measured, so it gives a better quality of the model, so it will bring the line down. But that is, this is happening only because by chance, this number ended up low. And so if you use the, uh, the observed error as a proxy to the expected error, you, you may end up in this situation where you're, you ended saying, okay, now the, average, the, the mean of my, my model was eight, but I tell you, I did this this simulation with a mean of 10. But now my mean is biased to low values simply because these points weight more than these points. If instead I did the fit, oops, I did the fits, taking all the errors the same, the square root of 10, because that's the, the real thing I need to use, all the errors would be the same, and I do the average, it is 10, as I expected even if this number ended up by chance 
being too low. Of course, the problem is I don't know how to do this. I don't know that I take need to take the square root of 10 as the error because before I get 10, I don't know that it is 10. Expert has some, some solution to that. I think I wrote it before. There is a command called wait, which, is, which can help you in some circumstances. Read that command. What did I say here? <laughs> okay. Um, that was not the last topic of my class. This is the last topic of my class because there is one more thing is, okay, now I got the, the model. Then I got the parameters. Now I got the confidence. Now I know I've got a good fit. Now I can say something. But how do I know that there is no other model that is better than that, my model? How can I test that? And now this is called hypothesis testing. The previous steps are called parameter estimation. We are estimating parameters, assuming that the model is right. But now I ask a step back and I go and say, mm, is this model right? It means nothing to have a good estimate of the parameter if the model is wrong. What if I add a line to my model? Do I need to add a line to the model? Does it improve the fit? How do I know it is? And where? when should I stop? And then I fitted the power law. Should I include a cutoff to the power law? How do I know? It's, it's, it's a topic that is not properly solved. And in the frequentist approach, there is something called the F test. And you want to know if adding a new parameter improves the model and adding another parameter improves the model and you want to quantify that. You need to do that. You need to compare the chi-square of the first fit and the chi-square of the second fit with the extra parameter. And then you want to give some quantitative estimate of whether that is um, better. You use the two chi-square, and the two degrees of freedom, and these things follow a certain distribution, and there is a program in XPEC, there is a command called F-test that allows you to estimate that. It will tell you, yes, you keep adding parameters, but at some point, the probability that you are improving is not very big, so you actually are not improving. You're paying a price each time you put a new parameter. There is a, a, this test. There are some little problems with that test. I recommend reading this paper for that. And I don't want to go too much in detail, but the idea is you can compare, for example, a line with a parabola because you added a new parameter C, but you cannot compare a black body and a power law because they are not the same model plus one parameter. So the models have to satisfy certain properties. I don't think I have time to do that, to explain that. I can compare a power law and a power law times a Gau plus a Gaussian where I want to know a line, but there are some drawbacks. Read the paper of Protosol. If one and if you cannot apply the F test, then the only solution is to do Monte Carlo simulations. And XPEC provides a command called sim test, I think, or sim F test, I forgot now, that allows you to do that. And there are, you can write your own Monte Carlo simulation. I think that's it. This is the book where I took many of the concepts. It's a very nice tutorial about Bayesian statistics. And I recommend that you watch it. And if you have any questions now, I direct you to Carlos and Mateo or anyone else in the class who can answer those questions, or you can ask me on the Slack. I'm sorry that I cannot be there. I hope you enjoy your stay there and that you profit from, uh, from this workshop and that you survive Carlos hopefully with the help of Matteo. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.